Welcome to the third LaTeX tutorial on embedded document elements. Embedded document elements are essentially any kind of a feature that you'd see in a LaTeX document that goes beyond the ordinary text structural elements such as sections, titles, subsections, abstracts, and perhaps mathematics. It's not going to take long before you find that you have a need for adding things like figures or tables or other external elements to your LaTeX document. So the aim of this tutorial is to show you how to do that. We'll begin with working on how to incorporate figures and graphics into your LaTeX document. And there's many ways to do this. There's many ways to include images and graphics in your LaTeX document. You've already created your graphics externally, maybe with drawing software, scientific visualization tools, or perhaps even a digital camera or scanner. And the simplest way to bring those into your document is with the GraphicX package. You'll want to load that package into your preamble just the same way that you would load other packages before proceeding. Once you've done so, you'll have access to the include graphics command. And it uses the following fairly simple syntax. It will take in a list of optional arguments through the usual square brackets and a file name for the external file, the external graphics file that you're hoping to bring into your document. If that file that you're trying to bring into your document doesn't exist in the same directory that your document lies in, then you're going to have to include the full path as well as the file name. In, in either case, you don't typically add the file name suffix, the extension, uh, into that, that argument of include graphics. The optional arguments, they end up being a comma-separated list of usually geometric specifications for the image. These are going to include things like how much you're going to rotate the image by, uh, how much you're going to scale it up or down again. You can specify the width or the height those types of transformations. Now it's useful to be able to add an image to your document and we'll see how to do that in, in the simplest form. But you'll often find that there are times when you want to attach a label to your image so that you can refer to it elsewhere in your text, just like we've done with equations or numbered sections and other elements in your document that have a counter attached to them. However, this isn't possible using include graphics alone. You can't attach a label to a, a graphic that's been pulled into your document with include graphics because those don't have counters attached to them. But there is a solution to this problem. You can convert your image to what's called a float by encapsulating it within the figure environment. So this is delimited by begin figure and end figure. Then inside of that figure uh, um, environment, inside the figure environment, but after the include graphics statement, you'll also put a caption command and you'll attach a label to the caption. Because the caption actually is what has the numbered counter attached to it. One problem with this approach and a problem with floats in general is that they actually do float around your document. That's why they're called floats. LaTeX uses an algorithm to place them optimally subject to some internal geometric constraints. This sometimes leads to floats ending up in pretty odd locations in a document. This is especially true if you've, you're just started getting started writing your document and you don't have a lot of text in it already, because that means there's not really a lot of room to place your document to distribute your, um, not place your document, but there's not a lot of room to distribute your images throughout the text. Well, you can exert some control over the way LaTeX places its floats, especially if you use the float package. So this would be another package that you would uh, load into the preamble of your document. Natively, LaTeX allows you to have some control over a float positioning by supplying optional arguments to the floating environment, such as figure. However, these tend to operate as suggestions and requests rather than firm directives. And the float package adds an additional argument, it's just the, the letter capital H, that allows you to specify that the figure should be located where you type it in the document, precisely where you type it in the document. So the capital H 
stands for an emphatic here. So next, we're going to explore how all of this works with images through some examples. So what we're looking at is a document that's just going to demonstrate how to load some images that are you know, already existing in external files that we've already created elsewhere. We're going to load those images into the document itself. So ordinary LaTeX document begins with the document class. This time I'm loading the graphic X package, which we need in order to gain access to the um, include graphics command. The subcaption package is something that we'll get into a little bit later. And the float package is what we saw is going to allow us to take a floating figure and pin it to a particular lo location in our page. And, you know, as before, I've given it a title and an author and a date. I've rendered the date using make title. In this case, I am putting in an abstract. Uh, but in order to get to where we're actually uh, bringing in some graphics, we'll move down and see down here a few paragraphs into our first section there's include graphics command and it's fed the argument sphere and that's because there's a file name or there's a file named sphere and it's an encapsulated postscript file we'll talk more about file types and preferred file types in a little while but it's an encapsulated postscript file that would have an eps extension if we were to write it here uh, and it is in the same directory as this document that we're working on so what this will accomplish, what this include graphics command will accomplish is that we'll see that there is going to be a picture of a sphere that appears right after this line that says an example of how to use include graphics appears here and right before this line that says it imports the image in its native size. Now include graphics will operate in an inline mode and that's why I've entered a soft return, well, a, 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 not a soft return, a, a, an actual hard return without an indent, both above and below the include graphics statement, because I did want this figure to be on a line by itself without any leading text before it or following text after it. Now, in order to see how some of the optional arguments work with include graphics, I, in, in another paragraph, I will pull the same image in to my document using um, the scale parameter. And what I'm trying to do here is scale that picture down, the picture of the sphere down, to 75% of its, its native size in our document. Let's go ahead and actually compile this so that we can see how our document looks. I'll run PDF LaTeX twice and then view it. and there's our first sphere. It's loaded into the document. I'll blow it up a little bit so you can see it all a little bit more clearly. So there's the very first result of the include graphics command that we've used. And then about a paragraph later, we can see the same, same image pulled in, but this time it's been scaled down to 75% of its native size. Now, I've embedded in the, this text some useful information about the optional arguments that you're most likely to use with include graphics. So in addition to specifying the, the scale, the scaling parameter that you'd use to either shrink down or blow up your image, you might find that you would want to specify an absolute width of your image, an absolute height of your image, a directive to keep the native aspect ratio of your image, you can also specify an angle and an origin, and those often work best by in pairs. The angle is going to be a, a measure in degrees of the angle that you want to rotate the, the image around in a counterclockwise direction relative to some center, to an origin. And if you don't specify the origin, the, uh, the default is the, the um, I believe it's the bottom left corner that will be rotated around, but you can specify the origin to be the, um, the left side, the right side, around the center of the image, the bottom uh, of, of the image, the top of the image, or even the baseline of the image. And uh, you can combine those. So if you wanted to rotate around the bottom left corner, you would do LB. 
and that would be a parameter that you could supply into that comma separated list of optional arguments into the square brackets of include graphics where we've only you know supplied scale so those are worth experimenting with and in a little while i'll show you in the latex wiki book where you can find some examples where some of those additional uh, arguments have been used Now, as far as what some of that might look like, here's a command where I'm loading in another image, an image of a paraboloid, and you can see it shrunk down in our, our formatted document. This is one where I've, I've um, set the width of the the um, image and I've set it so that it is 75% of, of, of a LaTeX constant, the text width. And what that is, is the space between margins of, of, of your text. So I want my image to only be 75% 70 of the uh, width of the text on my page. I'm insisting that I'm going to keep the aspect ratio so I'm not just shrinking the width down, I'm shrinking the height down proportionally. Then I'm also spe specifying a rotation angle of 30 degrees counterclockwise around the um, midpoint of the left edge of the image. That's LC for left center. And then the image itself is called paraboloid. And so doing that inside of include graphics gives us this funny tilted image of a, of a graph of a elliptic paraboloid surface. Now, when it comes to converting images that we've pulled in using include graphics into a float, really almost all it takes is wrapping a figure environment around that image. And that's what I've done down here. I've, I've gone back to the sphere, the 75% scaled down sphere, and I've wrapped a begin figure and an end figure around it. You'll see though that there are two other things that I do one of them is just stylistic. If I put the centering command before include graphics, that will center the picture in between the uh, margins. And then the caption command is what really is the point of, of wrapping a figure around our, our, um, our image. And that allows us to put a, you know, a descriptive caption beneath the image, but it also allows us to attach a label to that caption so that we could refer to the whole complex, to this whole figure with its caption by a reference elsewhere in the text. And you can see that I've done that up here. I've said look for figure ref f sphere, and f sphere is the label that I've attached to that figure. And so what that's going to look at, like, well, let's pay attention to where things are. The where I actually have the figure typed into the LaTeX document is right after this sentence. This centers the image between margins within the figure. So we're going to look for that sentence in our document. That's probably not where the figure is going to end up, though, because it's a float. So let's go look. So there's the figure, figure one a sphere. And it's actually occurring before the place where I described it in my document. Because remember, I described it in my, my document. Uh, let's see if I can find it here. Described it in my document again. It centers the image between the margins within the figure. Let's find that text. Yeah, it's right here. So right after this sentence where my... Uh, my pointer is, is where I would have typed that figure environment to my text. But we can see that LaTeX has gone ahead and floated it. It's placed it elsewhere in the document according to some rules that it calculates. So there's going to be times where I might not want it to do that. And the solution to that, that issue, I won't really call it a problem because it's sometimes you just want to leave LaTeX to its devices to place the figures where it thinks it's going to fit best. So the solution to that issue is to make sure that you're loading the float package into your document through the preamble with use package. And then instead of 
wrapping just the figure environment around your include graphic statement, you're going to pass an optional argument of capital H to that figure environment. And so that's the only thing I've changed. Now when I'm getting ready to create a new figure with that, that sphere again, I basically create the same thing. Begin figure, centering, include graphics, scale equals 75% sphere. It's all down here. Caption's a little bit different, and I give it a different label, but other than that, it's the same image. But I've passed it that argument of that optional argument of H, capital H, and that's insisting that that figure get placed right here in the text, right after this sentence that says, and it should cause figure F of anchored sphere to appear below in our formatted document. So let's see if it worked. Blow up our formatted document a little bit. We say, Example of its use appears next in our LaTeX document, and it should cause figure two to appear below in our formatted document. And there it is, there's figure two. So that's the effect of using capital H together with the float environment, or the, um, the float package, that capital H gets used as a optional argument for the figure environment to specify that that floating figure should be located right where you type it in your document. Now, there's often more things that you'll like to do with figures when it comes to putting graphics into your document. Sometimes you might want to arrange several images into a grid that get encapsulated within a single float. And the sub-figure environment allows you to do this. So it requires you to load another package, the subcaption package. And you'll, you might remember that we've loaded that package into our sample document. Um, but if, if you do so, then that's going to give you some functionality that will allow you to create complexes of images like this, each with their own captions. Um, but this is, this is treated as one big figure, just with several sub-figures in it. Let's go back to our TechMaker editor and see if we can make sense of how this works, how sub-figures work. So here's an example. So it all is still encapsulated inside of a figure. And it's a figure that I'm choosing to lock in place using the optional argument of H still. So I, I would have needed and do, did need the, the float package for that. But inside of that, what you're going to see is that, you know, we'll, we begin with centering again, but then here, let's blow up the page width a little bit. What you'll see is that there is a sequence of subfigure environments. So begin subfigure B, supplying a required argument of a width. It's a width that you want the individual figure in this complex of figures to have. So I'm saying I'd like it to be 40% of the text width, the space between margins. And then I just need to give it um, the include graphics command so that I'm telling it which image to load. And the caption. And then a label. Notice that the caption and label work a little bit differently inside of subfigure, though. Label can appear outside of caption as opposed to inside when we were working with figure itself. Well, once I've done that first image, the image of a sphere, I can move on and include other subfigures with this con within this, this complex. So this is going to be a subfigure of a, of a file called Taurus. And I have that file in my, my working directory. Then after that, a subfigure of the paraboloid image. And then once I'm done adding figures to this complex, subfigures to this complex, I close the whole thing off with the figure, or close off the, the figure environment with an end figure. I can put as many figures as I want. The moment I run out of horizontal space for a new figure, it's just going to return to the next line and start listing figures left to right horizontally. So that's the way this sub-figure environment works, is that it just starts adding the sphere, the torus. That used up 80% of the text width, so there's not enough room for another, another uh, figure. So when I try to add the paraboloid, that just moves on to the next line. 
there's an even number and an odd number, they get centered and staggered like we're seeing here. If um, I have the same number of figures on the top and bottom row, then it would be a square grid. But that's, that's how these, these environments end up working for you. Another embedded document element that can be really useful when you're writing LaTeX documents are tables. And tables can be a great way to summarize data within your LaTeX documents. Like images, tables can be embedded directly into your document, the way we did with include graphics, without the aid of a float. Um, and this is done using the tabular environment. The syntax is somewhat involved for tabular, so we'll explore it through some examples in a little bit. But just like we saw with include graphics, figure, and caption, the tabular environment can also be wrapped in a floating environment, and that's the table environment together with a caption. The subcaption package also offers a means of grouping tables together within a single float, and it behaves pretty similarly to the way subfigure works with the include graphics and figure. What we're looking at now is our example document that's going to give us some examples of how to format ta tables and data. We're going to start simple or simpler, just like we did with, with the um, include graphics command. We're going to create a table of data in our document that doesn't exist the, within a float. We won't be able to add a caption to it, but it'll appear right where we want it to in our, our document. So the tabular environment is delimited with begin tabular and end tabular. And it has a second required input argument that's a formatting argument or a set of formatting specifiers. That's what we see right here in this tabular example is that there's this, this sequence of letters, C, 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 C. So formatting specifiers are going to dictate how the contents of each column is going to be aligned. Is it going to be left justified? Is it going to be right justified? Is it going to be centered? Um, there's also a, a way to say that the contents should be word wrapped as a paragraph within a column that's given a specified width. All right, so R, L, and C are how you create a column that is right justified, left justified, or centered. And P is the fourth uh, formatting specifier that you can supply inside of this, this group uh, here for tabular. And it requires, it's, we'll, we'll see an example later, but it requires its own input argument of a, of a absolute or relative width. So let's see how this example is structured and see what we can do with it. Actually, probably the best thing to do here would be to go and look at how the table looks in the compiled document. And it's right here. So we've got a header, bold-faced, and that header uh, sits on a row by itself, and it spans the entire column, set of columns. But the, the table itself has this four-column structure to it. Now, each of the columns have their own headers with italicized math text. And then um, those headers are separated but from the main body of data with a, a horizontal line. And then the table is also begun and ended with horizontal lines as well. So those horizontal lines are called rules. Um, the title data is called a header as, as are x1, x2, y, and yp. And then the rest of the information in the table are just entries. They're, you know, they're, they're data. So let's see if we can take that overall structure and see if we can make sense of how um, the tabular environment formats it for us. And that's what we're looking at right here. Well, after begin tabular and before end tabular, that's where all of the, the, the data for the, the contents of the table go. So the very first thing we see is a command called top rule. That's what draws this thick, solid line at the top of the table. After that, this word data, I need to have a way of causing this single header to 
treat this next row as if it were a single cell and inhabit that cell in a centered position. Well, the multi-column command is what allows me to take a piece of data and cause it to span two or more columns. The way multi-column works is that I have to tell it, so it's, it's going to be, with the multi-column command itself, is going to be data that fills two or more cells. Um, and I've got to tell it how many cells I want this to span. Four in this case. I want it to span the entire width of my table. I want the contents of this multi-column environment, in other words, the word data, to be centered across this, this sort of merged set of four columns. And the contents itself, you know, the word data, boldface, well, that goes into the third required input position of the multi-column command. And I've just boldfaced it using the textbf command. Once I'm done filling out the data for my first row, I terminate the row with the hard return symbol. Then I format the headers for the columns on my next row. And now there's no need to use multi-column anymore because I've got four columns and four headers. And I just render them as mathematics, x1, x2, y, and y sub p. They're separated by ampersands. We've seen this in the p matrix environment, so it's somewhat similar to the tabular environment. That, that's a tab stop is what the ampersand is. It separates the contents of one column from the next. And when I'm done entering that data, I, I, um, I get to the end of the row and I terminate it with a, a hard return. And I draw my top rule again so that I can have this horizontal line underneath my column headers. Then I just have to start entering the data one row at a time within each row, one column at a time separated by the tab stops. Each time I get to four pieces of data, I terminate the row with a hard return and move on to the next row until I'm done. Now this, this data it actually came from a data set. It came from a regression problem. So x1 and x2 are the predictor variables. y is the actual response and yp is the predicted response. And there's a lot more data than what's displayed here in this table. So I just represent that because I'm just trying to use this table as a summary of that data. So I represent that there's some missing data by drawing these vertical ellipses uh, through the between the, uh, the the fifth row and the last row of the, the the data set, and I can render those using the v dots command slash v dots, and so I just do that by creating a new row for the table with v dots in each column. Terminate that row, and then I put in the final row of data from my data set. When I'm done with that, I conclude my table with a bottom rule command and finally terminate the table with in tabular. And just like we saw with the raw use of include graphics without wrapping a float around it, I put a hard return above and below the tabular environment so that it wouldn't have leading text or following text right before or right after the table, treating it as if it was an inline element. And if I do all of that data entry correctly, I should get a table that looks like this within my document. Now, should be clear that using these bottom rule and top rule, and, and I didn't use a mid rule, but I could have used a mid rule on this, using those, those horizontal lines required me to load the book tabs package in the preamble of my document, and that's, that's right here. Uh, another table package that I'm going to make use of in a little bit is the multi-row package because it might seem surprising that, that the multi-column command is native to LaTeX. There isn't a multi-row command to allow you to cause data to span uh, cells of, of two or more rows. But there is a package that gives you one, and it's the multi-row package. We'll experiment with that in a little while. Here's a much more complex example. This is what it would look like rendered. And we can see that there's 13 columns to this data set. Um, there's a header that spans. So there's some similarities with the previous table that we saw. There's a 
header that spans the entire table, and there's column headers under that. But then this final column, it isn't a predictor variable because this is another, this is a classification data set. It is a categorical uh, class column that talks about whether a person is dead or alive. Uh, did they suffer fatal heart failure or not? Well, that class makes use of, looks, if you look at it carefully, it's centered across two rows, the, the row containing heart failure predictors, the title, and then the row containing all of the column headers for the predictor variables. So that's an example of how multi-row would have been used. Um, and then the rest of, of what we see in this, this, this table is pretty similar to what we saw before. It's just a bunch of data entered in in the usual way. So the only thing that's really new here is where I've used multi-row to put that class column header in, but it is a more complex uh, table. Now, there's a lot more that can be done with tables. And what I think is probably the best way to approach designing tables is to, first of all, design your table. You know, get out a piece of graph paper and set up the layout before you start trying to code something like this. Or at the very least, set up your table in a spreadsheet. And then if you get good at working with the tabular environment, it, it ends up getting, you know, if you, if you get some practice, it ends up getting easier to figure out how to format just by hand your, your table. But for large data sets, if you have a need to, you know, put one into your document, it can be pretty tedious. So there are some tools that you can use that will take native spreadsheet tables or large data sets that are created in um, tabular formats and programming languages like MATLAB or Python and convert them to this, this LaTeX format here. Some of those work better than others, but um, they're there and they can give you a pretty decent starting point for rendering, you know, for, for, for typesetting a table like this. Now, where would you learn about this, this kind of information? Well, it's probably a good time to bring it up, but the LaTeX Wikibook has a pretty good chapter on, on tables. So when we get to the end of this, this example, we're going to return to the LaTeX Wikibook and look at its chapters, both on graphics and on tables, so that you can just get a sense of what additional information is there uh, that will help you as you move on to format your own figures and graphics and, and tables in your, your document. Before we get there, to remember that tables can actually be put, or the tabular environment can actually be put into a float and that float is the table environment. And it really works very similarly to what we did with the figure environment. We would wrap a begin table and end table, there it is, around our tabular environment that we've already worked with. We stick a caption in there right after the tabular environment. And sometimes you might find that you've gone to the trouble of formatting a table and it's too big. It's too big to fit in your document. And if that happens, using a resize box, here's the syntax for it. So you specify a, a width that you want the contents of the resize box to occupy. In this case, the contents is going to be the tabular environment itself. You want it to occupy. Give it a exclamation point if you just want it to pick up the native scaled height. And then curly braces around the contents, you know, the, the, the information that you want to be resized. And all that's going to do is scale that tabular environment the way it gets rendered on the page down to, in this case, 90% of the width of the text between margins in the document. So that's going to guarantee that it's going to fit. So sometimes that's a useful technique to take a table that's just too big to be rendered on your, your page. Um, so all of that, you know, from centering, the resize box, the tabular environment, 
and then the caption together with the label. Those are embedded inside of the table environment, begin table and end table. Um, that turns it into a float. The caption gives it a way that you can attach a label to it so that you can reference that label. And if you want, if you've loaded the float package, you can also give it the optional argument of a capital H so that it pins that table, the floating table environment, with its caption to that particular location in your text where you've written it. And that's what's happened right down here. There's our floating table with a caption attached to it. And we've referred to that that caption or that yeah, that table right here. Um, LaTeX document and the data itself should be rendered below in table one. There it is. Now, just like I don't do this very often, but just like we saw with figures, we can have more than one table clustered into an array of tables using the subcaption package once once more. So we can get something like this. And so here's a good use case where I've got two separate tables of data that's similar in terms of what it represents, but different in terms of maybe the populations that it's representing. So here's a table of um, European teacher salaries and then a table of U.S. teacher salaries. And, you know, it, this gives us a good way to do a side-by-side -side comparison of two tables that have a similar intent. How would you render something like this? It, it's really pretty similar to what we did with the sub-figure environment uh, when we were working with figures. So here's the hierarchy. We'll have a, a table environment. That's the float. Inside of the table environment is our first subtable. Inside of the subtable environment is our actual tabular environment that render, renders the tabular data itself. And then that's it. Afterwards, the next subtable environment. And then we close the table environment, the load environment. That's it. So that's how you would render these, these groups of tables. And it's going to behave the same way. If I gave it five or six tables, it's going to fit as many of them on one row as there's room to fit. And then it will just create a new row as needed and start running more tables side by side. So sometimes that can be a useful visual tool for comparing different but similar tables. Well, as you can surmise, there's there's a lot that's possible when you're working with figures and tables in LaTeX. And we've only scratched the surface. Now, I've given you two example files that you can use as templates to modify and copy and paste and try to use them as a starting point to get your own work with figures and with, with tables started. But at some point, you have to get to the point where you can gain an understanding of how those environments actually work and what options are available with them so that you can take the most advantage of them, and get um, the most benefit from the flexibility that they provide. And so our, our LaTeX Wikibook is a good reference for trying to accomplish either of those goals, how to work more effectively with figures and how to work more effectively with tables. If we look at the contents of our Wikibook, we'll see that there are chapters in the common elements, the sections in the common elements chapter that address both. So there's a table chapter, and then there's also a chapter on graphics, and then also a chapter working with floats. We'll look at these in the order that we've addressed them in our, our own tutorial. So we'll go to the importing graphics chapter. And what you'll see is that there's a brief amount of information it shows you how to use the include graphics command to import external graphics. And there's not a whole lot here that we haven't already addressed, um, but it's it's good to have this as, a, as a, an example um, just to go and, and review the basics.
what I think you will find to be new in this, this chapter on graphics is a lot of information on working with the different allowable graphics formats that you can import into your LaTeX document using, using um, include graphics. And so what I will say is that if it's at all possible, you're going to have a better time if you can work with graphics that were natively created into either an encapsulated postscript or a PDF format, EPS or PDF. Um, those are vector drawn graphics. And the reason why they're preferable is that if you scale them up or shrink them down, they don't become pixelated or they don't exhibit aliasing problems where, where you are deleting too much information between, you know, the scan lines of, of, a, of a bitmap graphic like a JPEG or a GIF or even a TIFF. So it's not that those other formats can't be pulled in to your document using include graphics. It's just that if you start using the scale optional argument of include graphics, you might get images that don't look as good as they, 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 they you might want them to in your document. So really the solutions to that issue, it, there's, there's two decent ones. Just work with the vector drawn graphics formats like EPS and PDF wherever possible. And um, if you have to work with a, uh, a bitmap image, then just make sure that it was generated, it was rendered in the physical size that's as close as possible to the size that you want it to appear in your document so that you don't have to do any scaling up or scaling down. And then you should get a pretty decent looking image there. Um, there's a lot in this, this section, though, that goes into how to convert between different file formats in different operating systems using some free tools, some commercial tools. And also, it, there's a summary in here of, of different um, software packages that have the capability of creating different types of vector graphics natively. Um, and these can be drawing packages, these can be mathematical visualization packages, there's, there's a little bit of both. So there's, there's a lot in this section that's worth your review. When it comes to tables, this is really a great chapter still, because as you scroll down, you'll see that it gives you some introductory examples of how to create tables and what the syntax is for for doing so using the tabular environment. And as you scroll down, you'll find that the tabular examples, both in code and in their rendered form, increase in complexity. And so it's a great resource to have because you can just scroll through this section and find a table that's formatted in a way that's close to what you want to format in your document or has features that you would like to include in a table that you're trying to format in your document, and then go over and look at the, the code that they've used to generate that table and see if you can't incorporate that in your own design. So that, that, that's really a great way to learn how to work with tables, and I think it's a superior way to work with tables than just trying to memorize what all of the different features of the tabular environment are um, up front and then use them as you need them. You know, just just um, once you've figured out that there's a design element that you'd like to have in your tabular environment, go to the wiki book and see if you can't find an example that's pretty close to containing that design element, and figure out how you can make use of it. It's really a good way to learn with these. So how do we put tables and figures into floats and give them captions. You know, we've already seen the bulk of that, but there is a pretty good chapter that addresses that. And there's there's not a lot here that we haven't already looked at, but I, I bring this chapter up because it is a, a good one to uh, refer to as a review when you maybe forget how to create a floating environment or embed a caption in it. Really, the remainder of this tutorial aims only to open your eyes to some advanced possibilities within LaTeX. We're not going to be exploring how to use these advanced features in any detail at all, but you'll have 
access to resources you need if you choose to learn how to use them in your own work. Those resources are going to be coding examples that I provide or the LaTeX Wikibook. Um, and a search engine on the internet is often your best friend. You can go straight to the LaTeX documentation or the package documentation for some of these features that we're going to look at. So some common things that I use or you might be inclined to use as you're starting to write about your own research, well, they might include source code listings. You might have some software that you've written in a programming language, and you might have a need to include that, a listing of that, that source code for that software in your LaTeX document. A good reason to do this might be because you've got a novel algorithm that you've implemented, or uh, maybe you're just trying to write a tutorial yourself and you're trying to document some code that you've written so that others can learn from it. Regardless of your pur purpose, you don't want to just list source code by copying and pasting it into your LaTeX document without doing anything else, because LaTeX will try to format it. And source code really shouldn't be formatted the way text ought to be formatted. It's often structured like what you see in this listing. So this is an example of a source code listing that includes proper indentation, monospaced fonts, and syntax highlighting so that you can see you know, what are keywords, what are some comments, and so on. And all this is is a listing of a MATLAB function that will do, uh, it'll compute the LU factorization of a, of a square matrix with partial pivoting. The tool that you would need to have access to in order to get this functionality in your document is the listings package. And so we'll, we'll see an example of how to bring that into your document in a little bit. Those of you who are inclined to do research in chemistry and write about it might find that the ChemFig package provides you with a rich set of tools for drawing molecular diagrams, Lewis structures, reaction mechanisms, and chemical elements like that. So below we just see one example of what the ChemFig package can do, and it's a model of the guanine molecule. ChemFig objects can be placed into figures, and that's that's what's been done on the, the slide, and we'll see in a sample document that it works well in articles as well. There's also a neural network package, and it allows you to visualize the architecture of at least relatively simple neural networks. Here we've got an example of just a very small neural network, including an input layer, a single hidden layer, and an output layer. So if you're doing research in artificial intelligence and machine learning, you might want to incorporate figures like these in your documents. Another example of a structure you might want to include in your document is a representation of a decision tree. Decision trees and other sorts of trees can be visual, they can be visualized and drawn using the TXZ and forest packages. There's other packages like QTree that are available as well, and they'll all render diagrams somewhat like this. The list that we've seen here is by no means exhaustive. If you've got a need for adding an external element to a LaTeX document, then the chances are pretty good that somebody else has already created a package that provides you with the functionality for doing so. You only need to get into your favorite search engine and ask, how, how do I do something in a LaTeX document? And you might be surprised what turns up. Scrolling through online resources like Stack Overflow and the uh, some of the user groups that are on the tug page and the ctan page are good places to get information about specialized packages that you can load into your LaTeX document in order to achieve a particular goal that you might have so before we conclude what we'll do is take a look at one more sample document that includes some of the examples that we've seen and then we'll move back to the LaTeX Wikibook and just look at how we can use that as a starting point for understanding how to learn more about some of these enhanced structural elements that we've, we're just scratching the surface of, of working with. 
So this document of other uh, external elements, you'll notice that it loads quite a few different packages for allowing us to you know, render these different things. Um, the one that you're most likely to use, I think, is the one that I'll spend some time to you know, give you detail on. It's the listings package. It's the one that allows us to load source code listings. So that's brought into the preamble using the use package uh, command, use package listings. And you could quit there. And what that will do is give you a monospace source code listing that it's just a simpler version of the one that we saw. It um, won't do any syntax highlighting, won't give you any line numbers, or um, the indentation is just going to be whatever it is. So if you want to go beyond that, then you need to customize the listings package a little bit. And I've got a way that I do that um, for most of my documents, and it ends up including quite a few lines, new lines into the preamble of, of a document that I find kind of clutters things. So what I've finally settled on doing is, you know, I load the color package and define a few colors that I'll use to um, do the syntax highlighting in my document. But all the settings that I choose to use for the listings package, I'm just going to put them in an external file. And that's my LST settings, and there's a bunch of them. And I'm not going to go through what they all are, um, but they accomplish a source code listing like the one that we've seen in some of the examples so far. So I'll just make this available, and you can cut and paste and hack it as you see fit. But it, I found that it's a pretty good uh, way to do source code listings for most of the languages that I program in and would choose to embed a listing of in my document. So the way I pull that into the preamble is with the include command. Include command is just given a file name and it's like I'm taking the contents of that file and embedding it right into the document in the place where the include command is listed. So it just it's a cleaner look. All right, so how does this work? In particular, how do source code listings work? Typically speaking, if I've got a complex source code listing I want to bring into my document, I'm going to use the LST input listing command because that allows me to bring in a external file. I don't really want to be copying and pasting source code and then, you know, maybe I realize there's a bug in it and so then I've got to fix that bug both in the LaTeX document and in the the, uh, the program itself, uh, it's just better to pull it in from a, a centralized file. Now, there is a way to um, hard code listing into your document. You can type it, and it's with the um, begin and end LST listing commands, and then you just wrap those around a source code that you would copy and paste in your document. I guess that's okay if you've got a small amount of source code that you don't think it's gonna change. But if I'm doing anything that's at all lengthy, I, I bring it in using the LST input listing command. When we move on to the Kimfig example, yeah, I'm just going to show you what the syntax looks like. There's a command called Kimfig. There is a notation that you would have to learn. I have not learned it because I don't really do much with chemistry. Um, so this is an example that I've just uh, copied from elsewhere on the internet and modify it a little bit. Um, but it, it just ends up being a, a notation that you would have to learn in order to format different molecular models. Um, so it's, it's a single command with that notation embedded into it as its input argument. So that one line is what gives us the guanine article or the guanine molecule that we've seen before. terms of neural networks and trees, it's kind of the same thing. The neural network package gives you a neural network environment, begin neural network and end neural network. And it just has syntax that allows you to build up different layers with different labels on them in order to get you know figures that look like this. 
The neural network package is a little bit tough. There's not a lot of documentation on it. Um, you can find an example of LaTeX source for a book that somebody has written when you search for information about the neural network package. And they it's a book about machine learning, and so it just has some examples of neural network architectures that have been created to look like this in the, in the, the document. So you can basically use those as a starting point, modify them as you go, and that's how I've learned to work with the package. But it's it's a package that seems like it's in development, so I would ex if you're going to use it, I would expect that it's likely to change over the years, and you might find that you've got to reuse or, or redo some of your work to keep it up to date whenever you you know you update your LaTeX installation. And then the decision trees, if you're using the forest package, you know it's got its own particular syntax that um, you know if you if you need it you, then you'll put the effort in to, to learn it and so that's and it just gives you a sense of what these these different uh, blocks of syntax will look like in order to give you graphics like this in your your document or source code listings like like this now if your goal is to learn how to use any of these additional features of LaTeX, then a good starting point is the LaTeX wiki book, but you might find that it is not your final step in your path of, of, of learning about these tools. What I mean by that is if we go down and go to the technical text section, well, it has a very good section on working with source code listings in the listings package. So if you're trying to customize a source code listing, in your own document, this is a great place to go. You'll find that there's quite a bit of, of, um, of functionality you can take advantage of and ways to learn how to, you know, get the syntax highlighting that you saw in my document and make it work. So this, this is where I would go in order to learn about the listings package. The others, you know, they're good starting points. So if we're back and looking at technical text, we'll see that there is a section here on um, the Kimfig package, and there is some information about how to take advantage of the different structures within Kimfig. What I suggest is that you do, you know, once you get to the point where the documentation that's here isn't enough for you is go to we'll open up the let's see if there's a link in here for us yeah right here kimfig it's going to bring us should bring us to the CTAN archive, the Comprehensive Tech Archive Network. This is where you can go to download packages that might not have come with your, your LaTeX distribution. And you'll find that as you're searching for information on how to use these different tools, you'll often end up at CTAN. And what's useful here is that there's documentation for Kimfig. And it's pretty good documentation. see that they've given you a whole book on how to use the Kimfig package. So if you're one of those people that's going to be doing some research in chemistry or research that involves chemistry and you need to describe some of the reactions and the molecules that you're working with, then this is a very good comprehensive resource to go and work from. You know, where do we learn about trees and neural networks? Well, neural networks aren't actually mentioned in the uh, LaTeX wiki book, but trees are if you go to the linguistics subsection of the technical text chapter. And so you'll see that there's quite a bit in here on using a bunch of different competing packages. You can just pick the one that works the best for you for writing up these different types of decision trees. Again, these are linguists. They're using these trees to diagram sentences and diagram uh, the grammars, but um, we can also use these structures for representing um, trees and graphs and, and um, 
decision trees that would be used in maybe a machine learning context. If you did need more information about the neural network package, just do a search, do a web search. So this is an example of what I was saying earlier, where you would just go to the internet to get information about a LaTeX package that would hopefully, you maybe don't even know that it exists yet, but you're going to hope that it accomplishes your goal for you. So LaTeX neural network package. Let me see what turns up eventually. And it's actually on CTAN. And what you see in this one, this is this is an example of where um, the documentation isn't as great. But he does give you a sample of a book that uses the neural network package. And you can scroll through this book and see some complex and not so complex networks. If we just wanted to maybe download the whole whole package, you'd find that there's a copy of that, that book with the LaTeX source as well, so that you could just get some starting point examples for how to, how to make use of that package. So again, this is one that's not very far along yet, but I found it useful and you might too. With that, we're at the end of our third tutorial on LaTeX, embedding these external structures into our documents so that we can add new features that weren't really accessible to us before with just plain LaTeX. So I hope that you found some of it useful and that you'll be able to enhance some of your own documents with some of these features. We'll see you on the next tutorial.